All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Jill Marshall Anito, who is in the Washington, D.C. area today. How are you doing, Jill? I'm doing well. How are you, John? I'm doing excellent. And I'm here, as usual, in a actually very beautiful San Diego morning. Uh, so, uh, so Jill is a professional adventure coach, a voyager at heart. She helps clients overcome obstacles, embrace their unique professional adventures, a bold truth teller, a U.S. Army veteran, adventure traveler, former marathon runner. Um, she helps uh, executives and organizations uh, really to embolden, embolden them to fulfill their dreams, which is, which is a nice, uh, it's, 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 it's a nice undertaking, helping people. Uh, emboldening people and helping them fulfill their dreams. So what we want to talk about today is leadership. And, uh, and the first thing I, I, I want to discuss with you, Jill, is how much has the nature of leadership evolved over the past number of years? What are some of the changes that you are seeing in leadership or how people need to evolve to be leaders in this current environment? Yeah, it's so interesting because even over the past 20 to 30 years, like, um, you know, if we go back that far, there was this notion or thinking that to be a leader, you needed to have direct reports and organizations, of course, were more hierarchical back then. So then leaders or managers, like to be a leader or manager, basically, you have to figure out what had to be done and tell mm -hmm. people how to do it, when, where, you know, what, and so forth. But... Um, well, I want to back up and say one thing that has not changed that much is that the terms leadership and management tend to be used interchangeably. Yeah. So, uh, you know, leadership um, is often described as a manager's, you know, or the organizational structure, the management structure is described as its leadership. And mm -hmm. individuals who are in manager roles are called leaders. However, to be effective in an organization, both leaders and managers need to manage resources effectively. And leadership goes beyond that. So leaders really need to communicate effectively. They need to motivate others you know, to, to inspire them to get something done. And there are many definitions of leadership out there, you know, perhaps hundreds. One simple definition that I think is very, very valid today and maybe not so much 20 to 30 years ago is that leadership is about motivating others, you know, towards achieving a common goal. And you mm -hmm. really don't need to be in a, an official manager position to do that. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point just to pick up on because I do agree with you. I think people look at leadership and they look at an org chart and they say, OK, these are the leaders. Um, but as you say, I mean, leadership, you don't have to be in a hierarchical position to demonstrate leadership. And I think, I always think that that's, that's a message that gets lost because when you ask people normally, uh, you know, and I have through my career, you say, oh, you know, what do you want to do with your career? How do you want to progress? And they always go, um, I'd like to be a manager. I'd like to manage people. And I always go, okay, why would you want to do that? I can tell you it's not always the funnest thing to do. But... <laughs> But it's almost like we have limited that idea of in order to progress and be a leader, you have to be a manager as opposed to leadership in its own right. Right. You know, that's so true. And where I completed my training as a leadership coach, it was with the Coactive Training Institute or CTI. And mm. they really emphasize that, you know, you can be a leader. Everybody can be a leader regardless of role. And, uh, you know, a leader out front, what they call a leader out front is more of the traditional style where you're leading a group in an organization. Sure. However, as a coach, you know, an executive leadership coach, I'm leading from behind, supporting that executive who's out front. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many ways that you can lead. Um, and I know we're going to get into generational differences and mm. some of the challenges that leaders see today. But what, and what I find is really interesting is that employees today you know, think about like the millennials and Generation Y coming into the workforce and they don't want to be managed or directed. You know, they want to be led. They want to be inspired. So I think mm -hmm. today's leaders really need to have a more collaborative style and, uh, you know, be able to influence others. Um, uh, and that's and that's a and that's a tough and that's a tough thing, because 
I, I, like I said, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of things have changed with with leadership, and now we have, as you said, multi generation. I think we have the most generations in the workforce that we've ever had. Well, probably bar when there were you know child labor back in the day, but <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, um, but this has raised a lot of challenges. And I think in some ways, like uh, leaders have become overwhelmed because they're suddenly told you have to do all of these new things and engage in these new ways. And, and so they're all running over there. But yet there are still enduring leadership uh, principles and qualities. So we have to be careful about throwing the baby out with the bathwater because that's something that seems to happen a lot. We've seen it time and time again where something brand new and shiny and everybody charges over and they just let go of any any uh, any enduring principles and then they have to kind of row back and the pendulum has to swing back. So what are some of the enduring qualities of leadership you think that it's important that people don't lose sight of? Yeah, that is a, that's a really, really great point. Uh, I think about, you know, first of all, I want to point out that not every leader is a good leader. So I am mm -hmm. yes, that's true. <laughs> point out some of the qualities that are, you know, of a good, what I would call a good leader. And mm -hmm. first and foremost, you know, is the willingness to put one's team, you know, and to care for one's team and put, you know, others, I think, ahead of the leader. Um, I'm thinking of uh, best-selling author Simon Sinek's book, which is uh, titled Leaders Eat First. And he really examines like what makes a leader worth following. So that would be mm -hmm. a key concept. Um, you know, in addition, trust and integrity are timeless qualities of good mm -hmm. leaders. So the concept that we all, nobody's perfect. We all, we all can screw up. Anybody can screw up. And, you know, I think a good leader will take responsibility for his yeah. or her actions, for his impact. You know, a good leader doesn't necessarily have all the answers. They're willing to seek input from others. And, you know, consider that when making decisions mm -hmm. of, you know, empathy and the ability to connect, I think is timeless. Um, you know, you can re you can view people as resources in an organization to get things done. But if you aren't able to connect with them on a more personal level, I don't think you're going to be able to lead more effectively. And, and studies show that, um, you know, as well as a, a, another quality would be having this vision of the future and, Kind of aligning people, you know, to follow that vision. So it's something a greater purpose than yourself, almost that your, um, you know, people in the organization can get on board with. Yeah, and I think that's, and I think that's one of the things that's incredibly important is, is obviously, like you said, I mean, the communication part, the, the um, sharing ideas. But I like that idea of taking responsibility for things that didn't, you know, work because I think that's that's very healthy. And it's good for people to see because, as you said, I mean, not everybody's perfect. I had the I had the pleasure um, a number of years back, back of, of meeting Robert Crandall, right, who was uh, the CEO of American Airlines. He's the guy who brought in uh, mileage programs and all these fantastic ideas and uh, and uh, you know seat pricing and variable pricing and all that well stuff we hate, but it was good for them. Um, uh, and but he said somebody asked him. And said, you had all these great ideas. Did you have any, were there any bad ones you had? And he said, yeah, I had one terrible one that they're still paying for today. And that was, uh, and I don't know if you remember this. I mean, I wasn't in America at the time, but he had these um, lifetime tickets you could buy, right? Yeah. On, on American Airlines. But what, they, but what he didn't think through was that people didn't buy them for themselves. They bought them for their kids. Right. So they bought them for their kids. So he said there are people who are still flying free on American Airlines, you know, because they were bought them for one and two year old kids and stuff. And he never thought that through. So he had all these great ideas, but then he also had to say, OK, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. I didn't know there are all these people out there flying for free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. So as we get into, so those are some of the things you mentioned earlier about the multi generational um, workforce, and and it is and it is quite a challenge today because, as I said, you have all these generations in the workforce, and as you as you mentioned, uh, the millennials and the Generation Zs and that have a have a very different approach, and, and don't want to be you know managed so much as they just want to be inspired and let go on. So how do you how do you strike a balance because you can do that, but at the same time, there's you still have to you still have to get them to come on a little journey about having some level of of direction and management, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, that's definitely a challenge. And if you think about today's workforce, you know, I'm just thinking because of technology, we're so yeah. interconnected and think, um, you know, ideally in the in theory, a leader could compile this great team across the globe of the best mm-hmm. talent available because we don't have these geographical boundaries necessarily. However, there, you know, are definitely some unique challenges associated with that. You know, of course, you've got remote employees to make sure that they stay connected and that they're collaborating virtually. You know, there are language barriers and time zone challenges associated with that. But even in the same genera- even in the same organization, if you are physically in the same place, mm-hmm. you know, you have people of different generations who have yeah. different preferences and work styles. And I think now more than ever, you know, leaders need to take a bit of a more hands-on role here. I'm ne- I would never advocate like micromanaging as a mm-hmm. good leadership trait, but, um, you know, really viewing people as individuals. Everybody has individual preferences. Uh, you know, there are norms about how one generation behaves versus others, yet it's, you know, that generation is made up of individuals with different styles Mm -hmm. and now more than ever with the younger folks they're willing to not sit by and say you know i'm going to do it your way like they want to have their own impact in the world (laughs) so i think it's a matter of getting to know you know you you need to know your people more than ever you need to know their styles you need to know how to check in with them more check in with the teams more bring teams together whenever possible Mm -hmm. and uh you know so there's that hands-on component of knowing your preferences and also, I want to add that there's the, um, you know, the concept of empowering your team, too. So mm-hmm. as a leader, you don't have to do all the work. You can empower others. And I think the younger generations are going to be more open to this, you know, to be proactive, to seek information, to seek answers, mm-hmm. not just to sit there remotely and maybe get frustrated because my manager didn't reach out to me, so I don't know what to do. But instead, mm-hmm. John, I'm going to reach to you because I'm stuck on this project. So, you know, I need some assistance here. So there's that... Uh, you know, balancing act. And I I think one of the things, uh, as we we touched upon technology, I think one of the things is because we're so interconnected now that it's much easier for people to connect and reach out to each other and maybe cut across, you know, hierarchies and all of that. I think that's why developing matrix organizations is is really the, the best way to go because you need to have that flexibility. You need to be able to move that much faster. You need, as you said, to be able to leverage, uh, you know, and empower and leverage people's talents across the organization uh, in a much more fluid way because uh, the organizations of today and increasingly of tomorrow are going to be so much more remote and and, and not uh, and, and global and you know people not in the same room and that so you have to be able to have these great very easy fluid communication right right and it's more important to have them quickly you know via technology via text or mm-hmm. you know checking in and, and may, really using that technology to your advantage yeah and I think another challenge is uh, just with when we talk about generations I mean they they have statistics now is you know, uh, millennials tend to spend, you know, stay in a job maybe two years, right? I mean, there's gone other days when people were, uh, oh, I've landed in this job. I hope I'm going to be here for the next 10 or 15 years or whatever. And I think that's another challenge is that we have to get used to having a certain amount of turnover and getting the best out, you know, saying, you know, if I can get the best out of this person for the next two years, then that's great. Right. Absolutely. And I think that leaders need to, yeah, consider that. And also related to that, you know, develop others. So if I'm Mm -hmm. developing a team, I have to understand that they may leave, very well leave, you know, and look at the broader picture of it. Um, You know, hopefully they're going to, you know, be able to mentor others in maybe the industry or so forth. Um, Yeah. And instead of being so, uh, because traditionally, let's face it, I mean, there's been this whole thing about, you know, reduce turnover because turnover is so costly and it's so this and it's so that. But I think we have to accept in the future that, you're always, that your, your organizations are going to be much more fluid from a personnel point of view. And I think one of the other things I wanted to touch on with you, in order to do that, you have to create a culture and an organization that is able to cycle people in and cycle people out and it not be a huge uh, disruption. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's so key, too. And, and leaders really need to take a proactive role, I think, in establishing that because the cultural shift 
and change, maybe not for the better if it's left to its own devices and you have yes. that rapid turnover. So leaders really need to have a pulse on this. They need to understand what is the culture. You know, first of all, what was it intended and maybe that the organizational founders wanted it to be like, and then what does it look like today? And is there a gap? Um, and you can mm. do that through employee surveys. What do people say that the culture is versus, you know, these ideals that maybe the company was founded with. And if there's a disconnect, leaders can take an active role in really embedding the culture in everything that they do, you know, walking the talk from onboarding, you know, to their client interactions, to products or whatever they sell, really aligning them with the key values and culture that they want the organization to embody. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think that's the key point is, you know, to have a deliberate culture as opposed to just letting a culture develop organically. Because when you do that, number one, I mean, uh, you lose control of it, but then it just tends to end up being a culture based on probably the personality of the leader as opposed to the personality of the organization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you see situations where a culture might be or an organization might have been a great place to work at one time and they want to pride themselves on that. However, mm -hmm. you know, an employee survey says otherwise, like that engagement is really, really low. So yeah. you definitely want to keep a pulse on that. So in, in our last couple of moments, uh, what, what is some advice you would give for, for new leaders? Because I know it's, and when you take on a leadership position or whatever for the first time, you know, it can be a scary and lonely place. And sometimes people are a little reluctant to reach out and ask for help. But what is some of the advice you would give new leaders? Yeah, you just mentioned a key point that I was going to include is about <laughs> asking for help. But uh to back up for a minute, I, I, you know, I would encourage leaders to be to be proactive. Really, you know, mm -hmm. you are a leader of yourself before you can lead others. So, yes. uh, you know, really embody those, take responsibility for your circumstances, for your learning and development, for your growth. So if an organization provides, say, a leadership, you know, training class, that's often not enough. You know, be proactive, seek out a variety of mentors, um, keep an open mind, listen, you know, get advice. We were all new leaders at one point or another. Mm -hmm. So, you know, compile lessons, you know, from them and be open to hearing about their experiences. Another point I want to make is like really to reflect on, you know, your experiences as you move forward and learn from them. So mm -hmm. I recommend that a lot of my clients keep a journal and, you know, write about what went well, what, what would I do differently and reflect back so that they can capture their learning so that they're not moving ahead organically, but being more deliberate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hiring a coach is another thing. Like on your own, you don't need to wait for the organization. Yeah, I, let me let me just put an emphasis under that because that is something that I, I'm I've said to people on so many occasions. I did my my first ever executive level position. I actually, I hired an external coach. Nobody knew about it in the organization. I did it for myself. I spent my own money on it. Uh, and it was really, it was critical because it didn't just help me with that job. It actually helped me on my career path going forward because it helped me uh, crystallize what I wanted to do and what I needed to do and what I needed to do to get there. But the point I always make to people is, is uh, you probably, most people have a hobby or some outside of work passion, right? That I guarantee you, you spend money on. Maybe it's golf. Maybe it's something, you know, you spend money. I guarantee you, you've hired a coach at some stage to do that, right? Why are you hiring a coach to help you with the thing that actually puts bread on your table? Right, right. I, I could not agree more. Um, you know, having had a coach myself and being a coach now, it's mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a game changer. I think yeah. uh, that you would agree with that. So yes, mm -hmm. there are plenty of coaches, you know, who are willing to work with individuals. And the good news is that coaching is becoming more accessible. I think at the lower levels within organizations. But again, there's no need to. Wait for the organization to do anything. You're the CEO of your own career. You know? Yeah, no, and and I think that's a really it's a really important point that often people overlook is that because they'll say like, "Oh, the organization hasn't done anything for me," or like, "I would like to get this and I would like to get that." And you think, "Yeah, maybe those are things that the organization should do for you." But to your point, at the end of the day, nobody cares about you like you care about you. Right. Right. And exactly. And I'm going to add to that the, the asking for help piece that you mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning, too. It's really, really important for new leaders. And I think for the most experienced for C-level executives as well, yeah. you know, asking for help is a leadership skill. Leaders sometimes feel that they have to have all the answers, that they'll be seen as weak if they're asking questions. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not the case. 
Yeah, and especially in the world we live in today, that it's gotten so advanced and complicated and stuff. There's absolutely no way that uh, anybody has all the answers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, listen, Jill, this has been fantastic. Uh, so before we go, uh, all of your contact information will be included in your contributor bio so people can easily uh, find you. But just before we go, if you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Um, as you said, um, I am, you know, I, my passion is helping others develop so that they can maximize their impact in the world. I like to take a, a big view, picture view of things. And uh, my company is called Leadership Adventure Strategies. And to me, adventure is all about being outside of your comfort zone, about, you know, taking some risk and learning from it and developing and improving yourself so that you can maximize your impact. And that means different things to different people. It could be that you're taking a new route from home and that's, you know, your adventure of the day, but you can learn mm -hmm. from that. Uh, so that's one of my, I guess, areas of focus too, is, is helping, for, you know, providing that support so that people can get, you know, outside on a ropes course, or it could be inside, you know, in, in you know, or in your car, like you're stepping out of what you know is the norm for you and there's just so much learning and development in that so i love to help my clients uh kind of unpack that and grow and learn yeah that's fantastic i think everybody needs to uh everybody needs to shake it up a little bit uh, i think that's a i think that's what keeps us keeps us uh you know keeps 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 life interesting and keeps us as you say keeps us learning right so yeah, that we don't yeah. we don't stagnate or worse go backwards yeah. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop, Online Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thanks, Jill, for today. Okay. Thank you, John. Bye.